está indo então para o nosso último dia. No primeiro dia, o Francisco fez uma bela motivação. Acho que todo mundo ficou encantado com os exemplos e, inclusive, com as, uma variedade de exemplos que não se aplicava só à eletricidade, mas outros mercados. Mostrou falhas de mercado, mostrou lugares onde a aplicação do mercado dava certo, onde o central planning não dava certo e mostrou para a gente que um, 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 todas as cores possíveis, né, das coisas que podem acontecer quando você está nessa discussão se vai ou não o mercado, mostrou que não é trivial essa escolha e que inclusive desenhos híbridos são a, a, algumas são tendências que estão acontecendo agora. Né? E nesse, nesse segundo dia agora ele vai entrar em aplicações mais específicas, um exemplo simples, mas também trazendo coisas mais complicadas, mais para mostrar os insights. Bom. Uh, Francisco, Ok, thank you. Thank you very much for coming back. Uh, happy that you, you got this. All right. Uh, happy to see that maybe people came back and were not scared of the math. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, before starting this second part, I just wanted to very quickly summarize what we talked about yesterday. Yesterday we talked about market design. Um, we talk a little bit about mechanism design, how lots of engineers, uh, including myself, uh, we're, not, we're, we're not very familiar with that tool, and how that part of your toolbox. And then we, we talk about um, the importance of equilibrium modeling to analyze different types of electricity market design, or any market design, actually. You, can, you don't have to use this for electricity markets, you can use it for anything. Um, but it's very useful for electricity markets. So one thing that I want you to remember for today is this recipe. As I said yesterday, if there's one thing, if there's one technical slide that I want you to remember, it is that one. So how you go from an optimization problem to the key keys and how you can write that as a mixed complementary problem. That's the that's recipe. Um, and just, it, it, it's a simple recipe, right? Just, you just do the derivatives in all directions, basically, with, with all variables and you considering all constraints and you can run it using this uh, perpendicular sign, that's it. Okay. Um, so, today. Right. So today, um, I want to address three different things, three, three features of markets that I think are important. The first one is how to model risk aversion and the implication of financial markets, financial contracts. The second one is um, what happens when uh, markets are not free, they're administrative rules. Like say the price is not the dual variable of a constraint, it's something that the regulator comes up with, like an average price, something like that. That exists in many markets. Yeah. How can we how can we adapt our equilibrium models to take into account that and how that affects um, the final equilibrium? And then I'm going to talk about multi-level games. What are the difference with differences with single-level games and applications? Um, in particular, I want to highlight how many of the models of imperfect competition that uh, you see in a standard economic class can be derived from multi-level games. Um, there are more topics that I would love to cover, but we don't have time. Things like, um, I don't know, environmental externalities, um, asymmetric information, etc. Et Those are all topics that are re very relevant for markets. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we don't have time to cover them here. But uh, they're not less important because we didn't cover them. Okay. So first thing, risk aversion. Um, what do you understand by risk aversion? Someone could say, what is risk aversion? When is an agent risk averse? Okay. Yeah, very simple. Like if you had to explain that to your grandma, what's risk aversion? Any, any takes? Shame on you. Maybe you can say something. Let's 
industry. What's your interpretation of this question? I'm going to pick someone from the energy economy. <laughs> Come on. Anyone. Just try. Doesn't matter. You, you said something. <laughs> this is not good, for sure. Guilherme, please. I, I was just seeing you like doing this. You are the guy. How would you say someone is? You can say in Portuguese. Like your, like your delta of happiness is bigger when you lose some amount. Like if you lose one quantity of money, your delta of happiness is bigger than the delta of happiness that grows when you win one quantity of money. So it's like, that's my interpretation of being this case. This is it's a good effect of, of risk aversion. but come on, thanks. <laughs> I would like to use the Brazilian punctuality as an example. Like, if you're going to have a dinner okay. tonight, it's 8 o'clock, what time will you uh, leave home? You look, the average, the time to arrival is like 30 minutes. So you, we go out 7.40, like Brazilians call, call their 8.10. But if you are going to the airport, you cannot lose the flight. So you have a risk aversion not to lose the flight because you have a, like, a, a greater risk if you take it um, a little more amount of money if you lose that flight. So you're going to not leave home much, much earlier. So risk aversion. Okay, that's a very good example. So for risk aversion, yeah, that's a good point. That for risk aversion to make sense, you need to have uncertainty. Okay, you, you're making decisions under uncertainty. Um, so then risk aversion comes. Okay, so general, in general, most most decisions in the electric power industry are, are made under uncertainty. I, I think I said that in front of uh, someone that does appropriate management science in the US. And he said, he, he, he told me, and when are you not making decisions under uncertainty? Think about it. <laughs> yes, good point. So I, I actually, I was writing the title of a paper, and I put decision making under uncertainty, blah, blah, blah. And he said, why do you write that? It's obvious you're making decisions under uncertainty. Every time you're making decisions under uncertainty. It's more or less uncertainty, but it's always uncertainty. There's always uncertainty. I was like, oh, that's a good point. Okay, but anyway, in, in, the, in the electric power industry, we have, if you want to just do a very simple classification of decisions, we have long-term decisions, right? Investments, for example. You have to make an investment with unknown fuel costs, demand projection, transmission congestion, etc. Medium-term decisions, fuel procur pro sorry, procurement, and uh, the management of hydro resources. Uh, Short-term decisions, that's like day-to-day -day early decisions, uh, scheduling, conventional duration, batteries, and their uncertain availability of wind, solar. So, um, I know there are very good programmers here, and there are lots of super advanced tools to make decisions under uncertainty. You can use stochastic programming, or robust optimization, or whatever, it's your favorite tool, right? Try to make a good choice in terms of But the problem is that there is empirical evidence that in practice, uh, agents are risk averse. They don't just care about the expected outcome, they, they care about something else. Um, and it turns out that um, risk aversion is actually a very hard concept to grasp. Um, there are many ways to measure risk aversion, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that Economists really don't, are not really sure how, what we think about risk aversion here. Like, we say, oh, risk aversion is like you make decisions using this utility function, or a C bar, or you look at the worst case scenario. Sure, that's more like mathematics, but how? If, if, if you go to a meeting of stakeholders and look at how they make decisions, it's very likely that you're not going to be able to forecast what, what's the shows they're going to make under, given that they have multiple choices. Okay? So that's why there's no one way to say what is risk coverage, because we actually, we don't really know exactly what it is. Just, we just know that you don't look for, for the expected outcome. But one definition that I like is that um, 
an agent is, is recovered if that agent is willing to accept a, a more certain option with low returns than other alternatives that are more uncertain but with higher returns. And what's uh, the evidence that risk aversion exists? That there, there are insurance markets. If people were risk neutral, neutral no one would buy insurance for anything. Think, think a, a little bit about that. When someone told me that, I was, because someone cited um, at, at a conference empirical evidence that this exists, and I went to ask him, hey, can you give me the paper? I, want, I really want to read who studied that. And he was like, no, I don't need, you don't need to read any paper. Insurance companies exist, period. That's your proof. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, yeah, that's a good one. A, a, a nice way to say this is that once you have a an expectation, the true expectation that you have in your mind that how much you're going to win on average or something like this, and you open and you give some money to avoid some bad outcomes rather than this expected one, you decrease and you have a certainty to them that's lower than the expected. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's, that's more probably. general. Yeah. Way exactly. It. That's the definition I, I, I got from a decision analysis. Okay. I really like it. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do all the definitions here, so I just wave my hands and put me. <laughs> okay. Um, so there are many ways to think about risk aversion. Uh, when I took a decision analysis course when I was doing my grad, uh, my PhD, um, I was taught that risk aversion could be modeled using utility functions, like if agents have some utility function in here. Uh, and that's how we how we measure gains, basically. And, and you can model risk aversion using concave utility functions. And one way to see <coughs> uh, um, risk aversion here, one, there are many ways to explain it, but I think one easy way to look at it is that uh, if, if you're rich, if you have a lot of money and someone offers you a little bit more, uh, you're a little bit happy, happier. Uh, but if you're poor and someone offers you the same delta extra money, you're much happier, basically. So if you're poor and I give you $10, you're happier than if you're rich and I give you $10. Kind of like that. I bet there are many other ways to look, at, look for it. Um, that's basically one way to model risk coverage, utility functions. So that, that's, that's a favorite approach for economists. If you take an economics class or take a decision analysis course, they're going to talk about risk aversion. That's risk aversion. They're going to say this is. Um, people that work in finance or in engineer and engineering schools think about risk, uh, use risk measures. Um, so there are different things like the value at risk, conditional value at risk. Uh, there's the good deal measure. There are entropic measures, and you can just make a long list. There are many ways to uh, model risk aversion. And and and. They're kind of like illustrated here. This is, say, these are the, the potential distribution of outcomes. Um, these are losses. So you want you you don't you don't want to be exposed to the right tail to the scenarios of high losses. Uh, right, the bar is a point here. The C bar is like an average, right over a tail. Um, that's the maximum consequence, the worst case scenario, etc. You can. There are many ways to find research. Okay. I'm not going to talk much about that. Uh, the nice thing, though, about the conditional value of risk is it has very nice uh, properties. Um, you can you can uh, model it using just linear programming. And that, that makes it very, very useful. Uh, but I insist, it doesn't mean that decision makers actually think of risk aversion using a zero. It's just very attractive for us to model. But it doesn't mean that they think that way. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> there are people that I, I know that are working on thinking what is the what is the risk measure or the utility function that actually matches what that agent thinks of risk. <coughs> okay, so I'm gonna just give you an example here, a risk choice. Um, this is an extremely simple example. Um, you we have a firm that can procure Q units of a perishable product. You can think of like a, uh, like a battery that's gonna buy power from the market. 
and there are just two periods, so that battery buys power and then it's gonna sell and the world ends right there. Or you can think of like a, I don't know, like a grocery store that's gonna buy, I don't know, some avocados and then the store is just gonna sell it at, at some price and then the avocados are gonna go around. And that's it, that's the world ends right there. So um, the product costs Q squared, the first stage and in the second stage, there are two possible scenarios of prices with probably 0.6 and 0.4. We have a scenario of high prices, a scenario of low prices. I made this function quadratic, so um, it's very easy to find what's, uh, what's, what's the optimal procurement. Um, so optimal decisions are the perfect information. If you know that scenario one is, scenario one is gonna occur, uh, your optimal purchase is 80, if you know that scenario two is going to occur for sure, your optimal purchase is five. Okay, um, you get different profits depending on what scenario occurs. Right? If you're risk neutral, if you're risk neutral, then you care about the expected outcome. Okay, you maximize your expected utility. And if uh, if we solve that problem, we find that surprise, your optimal procurement is something in between these two values. It's not 80, it's not 5, something kind of like in the middle, 50, okay? Your expected profits are 2,500. Um, it turns out that if a scenario one occurs, your profits are 5,500, so it's still quite profitable. Of course, not as good as if you will have, if you've been prepared exactly for that scenario, you could have made more money, right? Uh, but if scenario two occurs, you are at a loss. You lose two thousand. Okay, and that hurts because um, if you knew that that scenario was going to happen, you you will have earned twenty five instead of losing two thousand. Okay, but that's the optimal expected. Uh, that's the op your optimal procurement under if you're risk neutral. So uh, a risk averse agent. Uh, will probably want to reduce the potential losses in this scenario. That that hurts. Okay, in exchange for making less money in scenario one. That's kind of like your trade-off, your risk over. Okay. So here, um, I assume that uh, we have um, a risk-averse agent, basically, and um, that uses that utility function. It's a exponential utility function. And the only thing I did is that I took that these utility functions, basically here, and I plugged them into this other function up there. Okay, so the agent doesn't count money, it counts the, the function of money that it gets from, from that transformation. Okay, so, um, and then if you want to look for the optimal decision under risk aversion, you just need to solve the problem under um, um, the, your find maximize your expected profits, except that now your 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 utility function is just it's not just dollar, it's, it's something else. You you move to like a different space. Okay, uh, that's it. It's, it's very simple. And here I solve the problem for for different degrees of, of risk aver aversion. R the R parameter controls how much how risk averse is is the agent. Uh, the closer you get to uh, zero, the less risk averse it is. And the further up you move with this parameter, the more risk averse the agent is. So um, you can see uh, as I increase the degree of um, risk aversion, the agent wants to procure less and less uh, of this product. Okay? Um, and here are the, the the profits or the utility in, in monetary terms, not, not in, in, that, in those units, but in those units up there. These are dollars. Uh, for the two scenarios, given that decision, okay. And as what what do you see from those from those profits? What happens as as the agent becomes more risk averse? Of course, it, the choice is to procure less. But what happens to profits? The expected value goes down. Okay, that's one thing. But what happens to like the difference? Yeah, it's more. It goes down as well, right? And it goes down the difference. And the other thing is that this 
really bad scenario, eventually it's, it's not that bad. And eventually it becomes positive, right? You see the point? Okay. All right. So the only point I wanted to make here is that risk aversion makes a difference in decision making. That's it. OK. You make different choices if you're risk. OK. So now let's get to the real business. So uh, sometimes when you talk to economists about risk aversion, they are going to start talking about a complete versus incomplete market. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? Okay. Uh, OK, this is what a complete market is. Um, in a complete market, it turns out that there are insurance products available for every possible scenario. In a complete market, uh, one, one way to see it is that there are these artificial insurance product that these two researchers, these two economists came up with. <laughs> they are called the Arrow de Bras Securities. An Arrow de Bras Security, that's maybe like a complicated definition, is nothing more than an insurance product that an insurance company maybe sells to you that says, if this scenario happens, I'm going to pay you $1 for every unit of that insurance product you have. So you buy those insurance products like in the first stage, like before you know what's going to happen. And then if that scenario occurs, then the insurance company pays you one. If you bought one. If you bought 10, it will pay you 10. Okay. That, that's how it works. But if any of the other scenarios occur, it pays you zero. OK? So one way to think about it, it's like suddenly an insurance company it made available products so you can adjust your portfolio for any possible outcome before you know what's going to happen. Okay, imagine like a decision tree with uncertainty like this. You would love to have full recourse to so that anything can happen. If anything happens in the second stage, you can like tweak your decision and you know be better. And out of the this insurance pro helped you with that. They they. they they uh, make available decisions in the first stage, basically. So it's great. The only problem is that they're not free. Okay, you have to buy them. Okay, it could be very expensive, but they are available. That's the thing. They are available. It could be very expensive for you to insure against one catastrophic scenario, but at least they are available. Okay, so we say that uh, a complete market. A market is complete if there are arrow the raw securities for all possible scenarios. That's that's the best way to say it. Basically, you can another way to say it is you can hedge against any possible outcome, all possible scenarios. So you want to you want to buy insurance against I don't know the possibility that uh, I don't know that an asteroid hits Earth. That insurance product is available. There's a company that sells that. Okay. And any crazy things like that, that those, those products uh, exist. Yeah. So that's obviously uh, an academic definition. That, that doesn't really exist in practice. Okay. So why is this important? Uh, that's important because um, if, I remember, if, if you remember, um, yesterday I talked about the two welfare theorems, how um, if the market is perfect, com uh, com perfectly competitive, etc., etc., Central planning implies markets, and markets imply central planning. Basically, everything is super efficient. That breaks down as soon as you add uncertainty and risk aversion. That's no longer true. Okay. If you throw uncertainty into the models, those results don't apply anymore. However, uh, Kenneth Arrow and Debro proved that if you are in a context where there is uncertainty, and agents are risk averse, if arrow of the growth securities exist, meaning that if the market is complete, then you get back the result that says, uh, okay, the market's gonna be efficient. Okay. But you need all those insurance products to exist somehow. Okay. It was like a mathematical. Hmm? Can you uh, call the uh, definition of efficient? Efficient? Yeah. You achieve a Pareto efficient outcome. Uh, basically, you achieve the same outcome that you would get under uh, central planning, assuming that you have perfect information. Okay, that that that, that was the result. 
you get to the best possible outcome. Um, so uh, the way they wrote it, they, they didn't talk about uh, arrow the broad securities. They said uh, there is there are equilibrium prices uh, for all commodity markets, and the tricky part is that when they meant commodity market, they mean all markets, including insurance market, everything. Okay. Um, and they all clear at the same time. The real market, like the things that you can touch, and the financial one, where, which are kind of like a <laughs> okay. So what's the problem? They show that the equilibrium exists, that is sufficient, uh, but there might be multiple equilibrium. They didn't say there's a huge CME. There is an equilibrium, okay? Um, but the equilibrium is unique if everything is well behaved, like uh, utility functions are strongly concave, et cetera. And this was a very cool result. Uh, some people say, well, uh, that's, a ver that's very nice, but in practice, some things are non-convex. Okay, some decisions are like binary. Um, just all this breaks apart as soon as you add those non-convexities. And um, Lloyd Shapley, um, Folkman and Start, they all studied this question and they, they found that, okay, if the non-convexities are small with respect to, to the size of the economy, this still works, okay? Which kind of makes sense, okay? If, if the non-convexities are small and there are lots of ages, it, means, it turns out that those non-convexities are, uh, that don't matter much for in terms of equilibrium, okay? All right. Very theoretical. So what about partial equilibrium, electricity market? Uh, I said, uh, and there are some sorts of convexity, complete markets, and perfect competition, we can get back to the two welfare theorems. So remember, the first welfare ther theorem said, uh, the market will converge to the result of a central plan. So the market's gonna be efficient. Uh, the second welfare theorem said, uh, whatever you do doing central planning, you could you can always do that, achieve that with the market, if the market is competitive and there's perfect information. Et cetera, et cetera. So you, we get those results back, which is great. Okay. Um, so here's a very cool result. This is from Ralph and Sears. Do you, do you remember that this, yesterday I, I talked a lot about equilibrium and my last, my last few slides I said, um, okay, if the market is perfectly competitive, Paul Sam also showed that you actually don't need to solve the, the first order condition, which are kind of annoying. You can just do central planning and that's the solution of your equilibrium problem, okay? And these guys, Danny Ralph and Eve Smears, very recently proved that that also holds for markets with, for com, uh, complete markets, basically. If agents are risk averse, there is a way for you to compute an equilibrium without having to model any of the financial side. Why is that important? Because some people read that and they are like, wait, didn't, doesn't this kind of imply that? Like, here you have central planning implies markets where the result is already there. Yeah, implies doesn't mean that it's easy to compute. Okay, it means that if you're able to solve the central planning problem with dual variables and primal variables simultaneously, if you know how to do that, cool, excellent. That that's the result of the of the equilibrium problem. What they prove is that in equilibrium, all the prices disappear, which is the result of Paul Samuels that I showed yesterday. You don't need prices. You don't need to know about prices. You you can still find equilibrium without knowing it, and that's what makes this result very cool. So there are some requirements though. The agents have to use coherent coherent risk measures. So they need to use something like a conditional barley at risk. Okay? Um, markets must be competitive. Uh, markets must be complete. Okay, you have to assume that there is the market is complete. And it turns out that if you solve um, an equivalent risk-averse central planning problem, whatever your, the investments you find, those are the same investments that a risk-averse agent will make 
uh, in a decentralized fashion. And the, I, I, I repeat again, the cool thing is that you don't need to model the financial contracts if the market is complete. That, that's huge. Maybe I'm not highlight, highlighting that enough. Um, however, in uh, finding that risk averse central planning problem, it's not necessarily obvious. Like, it's, like if you have, for example, four agents and they all use C bars, and they, use, they all use the exact same parameters on the C bar, then it's easy. It's like you have the C bar of everyone. But if you have many agents and they have different C bars, it's not super obvious what's the equivalent C bar for the central planner. Okay, it, it needs a little bit of work, but you can do it. Trust me. If you, and if you're interested, you can go into that paper. Is it still a C bar? Huh? It's if you have multiple agents with different C bar parameters, the resulting is still a C bar. It's an intersection of C of risk sets. That's how they put it. It's, you have to write up a bunch of inequality then it, one equivalent risk measure it emerges like endogenously from, from the, your optimization problem. It's not one C bar. Yeah. All right. Um, so I, here I mentioned coherent risk measure. What, what is that? So a coherent risk measure um, has these properties. It's uh, normalized, it's, it's monotone, has translation equivariance, it uh, uh, um, has homogeneity. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but some example, the best example of that is the C bar. If you have a C bar, you're good. You can use them all. So, for example, the, the, um, a utility the, a, a exponential utility function, that wouldn't work here. Because if you, if you, create an, uh, an equivalent risk measure using uh, an exponential utility function that wouldn't be coherent. So you could not use this result. In that, in that world, you have to actually compute the equilibrium modeling every single insurance problem, which is hard. Okay? Doesn't mean that you can't compute it, it's just that you're not able to use optimization. You have to solve an actual equilibrium problem, which in general, it's hard. Okay? Okay, application. So, for example, we uh, we look at the, at the Western um, Electricity Coordinating Council in the U.S. It's a this big network that goes from like if, if you split the U.S. like in the middle, it, you look west. That that's the Western interconnection basically. Um, so we have many options for transmission investments, generation investments. Uh, we capture solar wind profiles for all the different sites. Um, turns out that there are many spots where, for example, there's very good wind, but there, but but there's no transmission network nearby. So if you want to use those resources, you have to build a new line, things like that. Um, we had we had done the optimal planning for this uh, model before, and our question now was that, well, what happens if uh, if the agents are risk averse, how, how would investment decisions change? And we really wanted to frame this as an equilibrium problem, not as a planning problem. Because this is a, there, there's some central planning over here, there are some deregulated markets over here. We really wanted to think about this as an equilibrium problem. Okay? It's not like a central planner is going to choose generation investments for everyone. They're private firms that are going to decide whether to invest or not. Okay, uh, so strictly speaking, we want to solve an equilibrium problem. But it turns out that um, if if we assume that the agents use uh, C bar, okay, um, we can use that result. Okay, and if you if you assume that you can use that result, and that means oh, by the way, you can use central planning, and the result of a risk averse central planner is the same result that you get from a risk averse equilibrium if the market is complete. Obviously, we made that assumption. Of course, we wanted to use the result. <laughs> uh, so we say, OK, let's assume that uh, markets are complete and there's perfect competition. Voila. We have uh, central planning. So we use uh, weighted C bar, expected value, plus the C bar. We have just standard constraints here. Um, for example, here are some of the insights we got. So for example, these are investments um, 
changes in investment in, in megawatt per technology. Um, and as we increase this parameter omega, uh, the planner is more risk averse. And what we found is that, uh, I say the planner, strictly speaking, is the firms, right? If firms are more and more risk averse and the market is complete, they will try to stay away from combustion turbines. Here, we didn't allow for investments in coal. It's really hard to build new coal power plants. And they will invest more in, for example, like uh, gas turbines, uh, CCGTs, and more wind. That's the best way to hedge against the worst scenarios. By the way, here, uncertainty was uh, mostly regulatory. So like in one scenario, you had a very high carbon tax, in another scenario, a medium carbon tax, in another, there was no carbon tax. Uh, we combined that with scenario for uh, renewable portfolio standards. In one scenario, California went crazy about uh, their requirements on renewables, 100% renewables. Another scenario, 50, another scenario, there, wasn't, there were no requirements on renewables. So you can see here that the, the costly scenarios were actually those when uh, regulation were asking for lots of renewables. It kind of makes sense that as the agents become more and more risk averse, they sort of look at more at those scenarios, those extreme scenarios, right? When the carbon tax is really high, or when California says we want 100% renewables, which is kind of like what they're doing now. Yeah. Um, that's one application. Okay, so one question that comes from this is, all right, cool, we can use uh, that that result, that equivalency result. Nice, we have a set of investments from the central planner and we know that that's what agents are gonna do if the market is complete, if the, mar if, uh, the market is perfectly competitive. Others to invest and then spot market. Yes. Our question was, okay, but we're not computing, um, we're not seeing any of the financial side here. So there's some financial layer on top of this that we are not modeling because we don't want to model it actually thanks to this theorem. But the question was, are those, okay, we have, we have one solution for the central planner, but there are missing variables up here that we're not computing. Is the solution in this uh, financial layer unique once you fix the physical decisions? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Okay, the answer is no. Um, say agents are endowed with, uh, coherent risk measures, and you apply the result from Rathas Smith, the theorem, so you, you find the optimal investments and everything, and then you go and look and try to restore the financial side. You say, okay, I have this. Let's see how they're gonna trade securities, the arrow of the broad security. And it turns out that, for example, here they came up with a very simple example where uh, there was a unique answer in terms of investment, but there were three possible allocations of tr possible trades of risk between firms. And they are all the clue. So that's a little bit annoying, okay? Um, <laughs> when we model, we like to have one clue, right? U uniqueness, and they found that it wasn't unique. Uh, this is a bit, what I'm showing you here is like state-of-the-art stuff. This is not old thing. This is like from this year, 2018, okay? So we're, we're just learning about this thing. A lot, a lot, a many economists have developed very general theorems about these things, but they haven't actually computed equilibrium. And now we're starting to compute them and we're finding sur surprises, okay? Um, so one of the things that when I read this paper, I was like, okay, the, the, the traits are not unique, but one thing that they do not report, and that I think is very important, is if uh, the expected utilities or the tails in the <coughs> CWAR are the same. So think of uh, financial markets. There are many, many different ways you can get the same portfolio. So maybe uniqueness doesn't matter. Uh, maybe what you want is uniqueness of the portfolio, not uniqueness of how you co construct the portfolio. Right? There are many ways you can buy and sell stocks that will give you the same portfolio. And that's why you care, not how many of these or that you buy. So I don't know if this is a concern or not, something to be determined. Actually, the same outcomes like a distribution function. Yes. As a result of the, yes. the, the 
creates a portfolio derivative. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. If I grab these uh, purchases and, and sales of securities between agents, and I plot the distribution right of profits of the firms, I'm really curious if you're going to get the same distributions in the three of them, or if they're going to be different. If they are the same, then the uniqueness doesn't matter, really, because they all give you the same portfolio. If not, then problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, they see vector fields. Yes. Uh, are those three different so, uh, trades? Yeah, so, so or? no, this is a good point. Uh, so they, they set up this like a set of like def dif differential equation, and they look at the vector field. Yeah, so this is stable, so if you perturbate this, and you do like gauss Seidel, you're gonna end up here. Same thing with this equilibrium. You, if you perturbate this, then agents are gonna get there, but this is not stable. If you perturbate this, you move away. Yeah, exactly. So, yes. So I'm actually working a little bit on this because I want to learn more. There are many questions when you read the paper, you're like, Wow, cool, but I have more questions now than I had before I read. <laughs> yeah, I, I like computing things, so when someone shows, hey, even in a simple case, this thing is not unique, I'm like, oh, God, it's so concerning. Anyway, life is hard, right? Um, okay, so uh, in practice, the problem is that, that, that those were complete markets, the idea, theoretical ones. Arrow the growth securities, you can buy insurance for everything. But in practice, the mark, mark, most markets are incomplete. Okay? But those are of the gross securities don't exist. Okay? Uh, many risks cannot be hedged with financial contracts. Okay? Uh, some of the standard financial products available in electricity markets are, for example, power purchase agreements, contracts for differences, very common. Um, there's not a single type of power purchase agreement. Uh, uh, for example, in Chile, you can, I don't know if you can do it here too, you can index a contract to, for example, like a, a fuel index. Say you sell, you, you must, you own, uh, I don't know, coal power plants. You can index the price you sell your contract at to uh, some international coal index, for example. Or if you use uh, natural gas, you can index your price to the Henry Hub <coughs> price, for example. So if the, hundred, if the Henry Hub price goes you know, up 100%, maybe your your base price is going to go 100% too. So, so that's not just one item there, it's, there are many possible ways to hedge it. Also in Chile, for example, there are specific items in the contract that say, for example, okay, this is the price and you're the consumer, but if for some reason the regulator chooses to, I don't know, say, impose a carbon tax, you have to bear those costs. I'm not going to, I'm going to pass through, I'm going to pass you through those costs. Okay, but others don't say that. So, uh, infinite possibilities there. Okay, uh, financial transmission rights. I believe that these are not very common here in South America. They're common in the U.S. If you have a nodal trans uh, nodal pricing, when there is congestion, prices right uh, decouple. Uh, that could be very risky for for producers because maybe you're behind a constraint. Uh, this is happening in Chile. Uh, most of the solar power plants are in the north. Uh, they were planning on getting to Santiago with high prices. And sometimes during the day, <coughs> the line gets congested and prices in the north, boom, go to zero. And prices near Santiago are, I don't know, close to 80. And they're, they're very sad <laughs> during those hours. If you have a financial transmission, right, if you buy that insurance product, uh, the seller of that insurance product says, Okay, I'm gonna, anytime the line is congested, I'm gonna give you the price on the other end of the line. So it's like congestion doesn't exist for you. In financial terms, not physical terms, of course. Okay? And you can buy that beforehand, of course, but they could be pretty expensive. You know? So it all depends on what are the views of, you have of the world. You think it's worth it or not? Well, you have to decide that. There is insurance for power plants. I understand that today. It's really hard to find insurance for a coal power plant. Uh, and there are other forward markets, like uh, day ahead markets, for example, in the US. Uh, now they also allow for virtual bidding. So you can be, I don't know, Walmart Energy. 
you don't own any asset. And you go and the lady head and, and, and you take a position and then uh, you you face reality in real time. You just take a virtual position. Okay? So these are like the same charts that you know are around Wall Street. The people that live off arbitrage. Say you believe that there is a company that uh, I don't know, it's uh, profiting or it's doing something wrong every day. So you see an opportunity for arbitrage and you go and bid in one direction, right, in the ahead market, and next day uh, you, you might make more money, basically. This is all derivative stuff, okay? I'm not gonna talk more about it, but. In some places, people like that, in other places, people think, oh, God, no, don't bring the folks from Wall Street here. We're, we're in peace, they're gonna destroy everything. But some people believe it's good. Uh, and, and Frank Wallet has a very nice paper recently where he showed that after the introduction of virtual bidding, the prices, day ahead prices and real time prices, uh, got closer to each other. Basically, so it, it was useful. Basically, virtual bidders uh, added information to the market. That's good. And obviously, they receive a price for it. Okay. Okay. So, finding if the market is incomplete, the result of Ralph and Smear doesn't work anymore. So we're back to equilibrium modeling, hard. Uh, so if, if the market is incomplete, you have to solve the problem with risk average agents explicitly, considering all insurance products available. Super hard, okay? So if solving an equilibrium problem without uncertainty was hard, with uncertainty is harder, with risk aversion is harder, and then with if some insurance product is harder. Okay. Harder and harder and harder. So what the hell is that supposed to mean, right? Um, okay, so I here's the same example from before. Um, same firm, okay? Um, so two scenarios, high price, low price, you have to commit today to how much you, you want to buy. I think it's like a storage unit that tomorrow is just gonna sell. And the prices are already predetermined. One high price scenario, low price scenario, and depending on that, you want to charge today more or less. And now, um, and now I'm going to add um, another player. I'm going to say that now there is a copper mine that wants to buy power from me. Okay, and that copper mine wants to buy power not not from me, sorry, from the market. Twenty units, mega. Okay, so that firm wants to minimize its cost. It's like maximizing its negative profit. Same thing, right? So, um, and now that, that, that agent wants to negotiate a contract with me. Okay, so that agent, if, if the price is high, it's very unhappy. If the price is low, it's very happy. Okay? Um, we want to see if there's a possibility for us to trade a contract for this. Okay, so now I add a contract for difference. Let me show you how it works. So we have the, the consumer, the, the copper mine here that has the cost of, of, of buying power. I made a mistake, I think I changed the number. Um, but basically what I'm off the insurance product I'm offering is that um, we, will ex we will compensate basically each other for any difference between what we agree, the, the, the PPA price and the spot price, okay? So basically if we agree, if I agree to sell you power at $100 and tomorrow the spot price is 150 I have to pay you 50 okay? And compensate you for the difference. But if the price tomorrow is, say, 20 then you have to pay me 80 because we agree that the price is gonna be 80 okay? This is just a financial layer, okay? For think that for the for the system operator, this doesn't exist. This is just these are just financial positions, not physical. Okay. So um, that's how a contract for difference works. Okay. If you go and do the KKT conditions for this, you get this nasty set of KKTs. Okay. And um, you have this market clearing condition that says 
whatever I sell to you in terms of uh, PPA, you have to want to buy it, right? I mean, someone provides insurance and someone buys insurance, and, and, and that has to balance, right? The sum of all the insurance products has to be equal to zero, right? Negative values are sales, and positive values are purchases, or the other way around, depending on how you define it. Okay, but they have to net to zero. Okay? So I assume uh, these values for preferences to, towards risk, uh, I assume that the firm was more risk averse than uh, the consumer. And voila, I found a solution. This is a KKT point. Q <coughs> equals to 28.7. Uh, they negotiate this much um, contract that the volume negotiated, and the PPA price is 57.3. Okay? Uh, to be sincere with you, I didn't solve this. This is too hard. <laughs> what I did is I used kind of like a gauss Bell method where I started like trying prices, and eventually I found prices that balance everything. And I stopped, and that those match the KKT condition. Okay, I just wrote this so you can see that this gets pretty ugly very quickly. Okay, so if you if you don't have the Ralph and Smithers result, you're in this world. Hard. Okay. So uh, com let's make a comparison. This was the quant this is the uh, quantity that the firm wants to produce or commit in the first stage if there is no contract for difference, 5.1, for that level of risk aversion. Okay? And these are the profits or, and, or these are the these are the costs for the consumer. With the contract for difference, as soon as I make the contract for difference available, okay, the insurance product available. The firm is willing to take on more risk. Okay, it's willing to produce, to commit, to do more, basically. And um, both parties are happy.